refers to the area that is called sort of Southeast and Southeast Asia. Um, I'm going to be working in generalities here just because, again, this is a massive region and there are only a couple of artworks that are represented in this region. So I'm going to do my best to give you all of the pertinent information um, that is required to understand the AP artworks within this curriculum. So bear with me. There is a lot of context and I'm trying to just kind of simplify um, complicated information as much as I can. So one of the main things that you need to understand for this unit are the spread of Hinduism and Buddhism, which are two of the main religions that are spreading, starting around 500 BCE in this region. So these ancient belief systems um, were kind of kind of like manifested as these separate religions. We had um, Hinduism first, and then Buddhism come a little bit later. So um, like many other things that are happening in terms of East and West relations, information is traveling along the Silk Road, which runs roughly here. So India in particular has a very rich history that I cannot possibly get into the intricacies of um, within this particular curriculum, but I will let you know, and I and I want to emphasize that um, they India had this very fertile river valley and because of all of this, essentially what amounts to hot real estate, a lot of people wanted that land. So there are lots of invasions and assimilations that are happening in the area that is now called India. And because of that, when you go to India today, it is a very cosmopolitan place. There are actually 18 official Indian languages, which is astounding. And, and it really is a testament to how diverse this place is and like how the inhabitants of India come from all corners of Eurasia, essentially. So one of the things that we'll be noticing in these couple of works is that most of the art is made for wealthy patrons or in the service of religion in some way. Um, a lot of the works are intended to be communally enjoyed. There's large buildings, murals, sculptures, um, public places of devotion, and a lot of times artwork is created by teams to reflect a unified and consistent artistic vision that conforms with canonical texts and images. So you're oftentimes going to be having figures being sculpted in ways that are very recognizable. For example, we'll be seeing the Buddha over and over again, and despite like thousands of years of, of history and thousands upon thousands of square miles of, of regional kind of like variety, we see a lot of similarities in terms of how Buddha is depicted across geography and time. So this is a just very kind of like Buddhism for dummies introduction. So Buddhism is still a dominant religion in Southeast Asia. Um, there are lots of Buddhisms, um, if you will, that are practiced in different regions. So for example, Zen Buddhism has a pretty significant cultural impact in some parts of Japan. So there's different sects of Buddhism and they all kind of believe in different things, but a couple of central kind of like Buddhist beliefs um, focus on enduring suffering and achieving nirvana or oneness with the universe, um, releasing oneself from the endless cycle of birth and rebirth, which is called samsara. So the central philosophy of Buddhism um, centers along these four noble truths. One is that life is suffering, and suffering is rebirth. Um, one of the central beliefs in Buddhism is that when you die, you are reincarnated. And you might be born into a position that is similar to the one you had in your previous life, or you might be born lower or higher, depending on the deeds that you did while you were alive in your previous life. So this is the concept of karma. If you do good things during your life, then hopefully you'll be reborn in a higher station um, in the next life. But if you do bad things, then you'll be reborn in a lower station. Um, another um, focus of the Four Noble Truths is the cause of suffering is desire. So in order to overcome suffering, you have to, to overcome desire. So when you overcome desire, there is no more suffering. You escape that cycle of samsara. You but essentially kind of step outside of the cycle of life and death and you achieve oneness with the universe.
So one of the um, symbols that is oftentimes used in Buddhism is the wheel. Of course, the wheel is a circle. It represents kind of like the cycle of life. Um, the achievement of nirvana is essentially moving to the center of the wheel, which does not move. I always thought that imagery was really interesting. So the central figure of Buddhism is, of course, the Buddha, um, who was this which is this name that means the enlightened one that is describing the historical figure Siddhartha Gautama, who lived around 563 to 483 BCE. Essentially, he was this prince who rejected the courtly life to achieve spiritual med merit through charity, love of living things, and in some sects of Buddhism, meditation. So one of his main foci was the middle way, avoiding extremes. He said, yeah, like aesthetic ways, essentially where you are um, living a life of like extreme contrition, where you are like putting your body through suffering is not great. But at the same time, overindulging is not great either. So he was kind of advocating for this middle ground. There's a lot of symbols that are associated with Buddhism that we will see over and over again in this unit. We, of course, have the Buddha himself, and I'm going to be discussing specific kind of canonized aspects of the Buddha that make him recognizable. Um, we also have a couple of other symbols, including the lion, the lion which symbolizes um, Buddha's royal lineage. We, of course, have the wheel. Um, and then the lotus, which is another very frequently occurring symbol. Oftentimes, the lotus will appear in the predella or base of a Buddha sculpture. Um, this is uh, linked to biology, actually, which is one of the reasons that I bring it up in class. When you think of lotuses, they are these beautiful flowers that emerge out of these really nasty kind of like scummy ponds. So it represents beauty and adversity. Like you come from this kind of like this gross ooze and you become something beautiful and you emerge out of it. There's also this um, additional motif of the empty throne, which represents Buddha's ever presence. He's kind of like left the space and he's become omnipresent. He is everywhere. Another thing that you will um, see a lot within the context of Buddhism is Buddhist cosmology. So this is um, a if you can believe it, a, a rather simplified diagram of Buddha cosmology. It represents a, a more kind of like expanded um, kind of geographical representation of these, this concept uh, of Buddha's law. At the very bottom, we have the, the worlds of like desire and suffering. And then in the middle, we have the world of forms, which is more or less where the humans live, at least in the South region. And then we have Mount Maru, which we see oftentimes represented in Buddhist architecture. And then above Mount Maru are the layers of heaven. These are the, the worlds of formlessness where one achieves nirvana. So we're going to be seeing similar kind of like tiered um, levels of, of cosmology as we move forward. So just keep this in mind. In terms of Buddha canon, again, despite the geographical range of Buddhism, the figure of the Buddha remains quite recognizable. Even before you took this class with me, you probably were able to look at a Buddha and recognize it as a Buddha. So usually Buddha are seated in a lotus position like this, with the legs crossed, crisscross applesauce, um, usually with the balls of the feet pointed upward. Um, generally, the poses of Buddhas are very frontal. There's not really that much contrapposto, um, and they are sometimes adorned with a nimbus or a halo in the back. Oftentimes, there will be bodhisattvas or helpers flanking the halo. They basically look like little cherubs. They're little angels. These are basically enlightened souls that have kind of like come back into the mortal planes to help other people achieve enlightenment. Um, most Buddhists have a very detached facial expression. Oftentimes, their eyes are downcast and their faces are kind of slack. There might be a little bit of an archaic smile. Um, there's essentially like a peacefulness to the figure. He's achieved enlightenment. He's beyond mortal concerns. So he's just chilling. 
Um, oftentimes when you see Buddha figures, they will have different hand positions and these are called mudras. So the position and the articulation of the hands will oftentimes mean different things. For example, if a hand is touching the ground, that is usually symbolizing a connection with the earth. The hands that are brought in close around the bottom of the stomach is usually associated with the meditation gesture. There's lots and lots of different mudras. Um, a couple of other characteristics to note are the top knot um, and then also the cranial bump, which is oftentimes represented in the structure of the stupa, which we'll be covering in just a little bit. We have the urna or the third eye of wisdom right here. Um, and we also have these kind of snail shell curls. Oftentimes the Buddha is represented as having this very tightly curled hair. We have elongated earlobes, which is where the, um, the prince once wore heavy jewelry that weighed his ears down, but he no longer wears them. So he just has dangly earlobes now. Oftentimes he's dressed relatively modestly, usually as a monk as well. Sometimes the Buddha will sit on a base or a predela, which might incorporate figures of patrons or donors, or might include some didactic imagery, some images that show important scenes from Buddha's life or teachings or dharmas. So there are several different canonized Buddhas um, that are represented in art. Um, the two that you should probably be most aware of are the Virukana or the universal like shining sun Buddha, which is kind of like gigantic cosmic power Buddha, and then the Sakyamuni Buddha, which is a representation of Siddhartha Gautama. Again, I know this is a lot of information. <laughs> So our first artwork um, within this section are the Buddhas from Bamiyan. So Bamiyan is actually located in what is now Afghanistan, and it is located along the Silk Route. This was a commerce and religious center for hundreds of years. Actually, um, a lot of evidence suggests that even before the introduction of Islam, that Buddhism was in this particular region. So these were among the first colossal Buddha statues. Um, colossal Buddhas um, became more common as time went on. We're actually going to see more colossal Buddhas as we move through the curriculum. We will see some with the Longmen Caves in China. Um, the largest of the two right here represent represented the Virakana or universal Buddha and stood at around 175 feet tall, which is absolutely massive. And the other was around 115 feet tall. And this one represented the historical or Shakyamuni Buddha. So unfortunately, these statues were destroyed by the Taliban in 2001. I'm going to explain why in just a little bit. This image right here shows the Virokana Buddha um, prior to its destruction, and there's a human figure here for scale to give you a sense of how massive these Buddha are. And this right here is a, um, a bird's eye view of this particular statue and how it is interacting with these cliff faces. So these are um, basically sculptures that have been carved out of a cliff face in high relief. So all of this is stuff that has basically been carved away. And what's interesting is that you can actually walk where you could originally walk behind the Buddha's legs right here. And you can also notice several niches. You can see a couple of the entrances of these niches in this image right here. And a lot of times these niches actually contained like murals or paintings or other kind of like imagery of Buddha. The purpose of having the area hollowed out behind the legs was related to circumnambulation, which is one of the um, important ritual elements to Buddhism. So one of the ways that a person um, basically like practices Buddhism is that they will circle a monument, usually a stupa, which we'll cover in just a moment, or it could be a statue of the Buddha. So they would walk around it, similar to what we saw with the Kaaba in the last lecture. And that is one of the ways that they facilitate their religious practice. So that's why the area behind it is hollowed. It's So they're not just ping-ponging back and forth like this. 
So um, this particular statue was originally um, covered in a layer of stucco, which is kind of like plaster. This was to smooth out the porous sandstone, sandstone um, surface and make it able to receive painted pigment. So there is some evidence that these particular statues were faced in pigment and in some cases a sort of gold or bronze finish. Um, there were a couple of reconstructions that were made recently to show what these particular colors might have looked like right here. Um, these are reconstructions that are based on, on the rubble remains of the statues. What you'll notice too when you look at um, a couple of more images, and you can sort of start seeing it here, is that there's hundreds if not thousands of galleries that have been carved into the surface of this cliffside. So a lot of these galleries actually go into the mountain, and a couple of them actually lead up to the shoulder of the Buddha, so you can actually, like, or you could, again, actually chill up here on the Buddha's shoulder. A lot of these different niches contained murals. A couple of them are still intact. So unfortunately, the Buddhas were destroyed by the Taliban in 2001, and there were two reasons that they did this. One was the extremist views that basically rendered these images idols, and in the eyes of the Taliban, which were essentially these um, like extremist um, Muslims, having any sort of idol was seen as contradictory to the ideals of the Taliban. So unfortunately, um, they actually went into the, the town of Bamiyan and um, held people hostage and forced them to destroy the Buddhas. Um, so another thing that kind of like fueled the disdain for these particular statues was the Western interest in them. So they had been around for several hundred years. There was a lot of Western interest in preserving the statues and then um, kind of like keeping them the way they were or even in some cases restoring them. And the Taliban were like, okay, what about the local people who lived here and are in need of humanitarian aid? So there was a kind of um, co social commentary that was done through the destruction of these Buddhas saying, well, like now they're not no longer here. So what are you going to do now? So there is an ongoing debate um, over whether to reconstruct these statues. Um, it's been a, a, almost exactly 20 years now. I think it will be exactly 20 years this month in March 2021 um, since the destruction of the Buddhas. And there's been lots of different organizations that have visited the site and have sought to kind of figure out ways to reconstruct the Buddhas. There was a, an art installation about 10 years ago where two Chinese artists actually projected um, some holograms into the niche spaces. And this was like a temporary installation. And I think a, a pretty like nice short term solution, at least in my opinion. Um, you'll see here, like in the Bamiyan Cliffs, um, again, the size of the niches to give you a sense of how large they are within this landscape. And then all of these little holes that are cut are these um, little niches where these like, smaller spaces are located. People today, actually, a couple of them actually live in these little niche spaces. So I will include a link to this video in the description um, so that you can get a sense of, like, uh, from a person's point of view, exactly how this destruction was taken out. <clears throat> Our next piece is the Joe Rinpoche. I apologize for butchering that pronunciation of the Jokan Temple. So the Jokan Temple is Tibet's oldest and most important temple. It was founded by the first person to rule a unified Tibet, or almost... 1500 years ago. So the term Joel Ripoch means our Lord, the precious one. And this is oftentimes a, an honorific that is given to describe the Buddha. So the statue's hands are in two mudras or hand positions, and we can't really see them. One is in a symbol of meditation, and then the other is calling the earth to witness. So this is symbolizing the moment of Buddha's enlightenment. This is a particularly common rendition of the Buddha for the Sakyamuni, um, which is represented here. This is the historical Buddha at the age of 12. 
So there's a lot of um, kind of like speculation around the particular provenance of this statue. A lot of the people that visit this temple and like see this as a like significant object say that it was sculpted by Viswakarma, who was this celestial architect and that he actually sculpted it looking at the Buddha himself when he was 12 years old. So the association with Viswakarma, the celestial architect, as well as the notion that this piece was carved with the, from the likeness of the actual Buddha himself lends to its sacredness and its like hierarchical importance, which is why this temple is the most important one in Tibet. So it was said that this was intended to serve as Buddha's proxy in the physical world after he entered Nirvana. So a shrine, if you will. So um, the um, provenance of this particular object is what comes into question and what kind of challenges this notion that it was sculpted um, at the time of Buddha's life. Um, a lot of evidence seems to suggest that it was sculpted around 600 CE, whereas the historical Buddha lived about a thousand years before that. So um, the statue has been added to and refurbished several times. Um, it's difficult to know exactly what the statue looked like at its in its original um, kind of like state. Um, there is also the added complication of the fact that the statue was um, stolen and thrown into a rubbish heap during China's Cultural Revolution last century, um, and that piece after that pieces of it were eventually essentially salvaged and then put back together and then restored to the original temple around 2003. What you'll notice when you look at this image is that there is an emphasis on splendor um, and creating this very kind of like glittering gold, like perfect image of the Buddha. He has this golden skin. We are seeing a couple of his other Buddha conventions like the urna and the elongated earlobes. He has this amazing shocking blue hair and he has this headdress that is adorned in all sorts of jewels and finery signifying his importance. Also, it's hard to convey in these images, but this statue is larger than life. The next thing that we are going to be covering um, that pertains to Buddhist art and architecture is the stupa. So this is the principal structure of early Buddhist architecture and pretty much all the Buddhist architecture that we see from this point on out references the stupa in some way, shape, or form. So stupa are not a purely Buddhist invention. They actually existed before Buddhism, but the use of a stupa to um, contain Buddha's remains kind of popularized their use in Buddhism. So the stupa is essentially a hemispherical shrine, so that means half a sphere, containing relics or holy remains. So in essence, a stupa is basically like a giant reliquary and or a sepulchral monument. So you'll remember that term sepulcher um, from when we talk, talked about the Dome of the Rock class class. Um, sepulchral monument basically means like a monument to like a holy person's remains in most cases. Um, so there are a lot of um, forces that drive the construction of stupa, one of which is karmic benefits. So if you build, a, in, some of, in some Buddhist texts, if you contribute to the construction of a stupa, or you yourself kind of like are involved in the creation of a stupa that elevates your, your karma capital, essentially, and ensures that you will be born into a higher position in your next life. So some early stupas supposedly contained the portions uh, or small portions of Buddha's ashes, which infuse the monument and the earth around it with the energy of the Buddha. So there's kind of like this, this sacred element to the stupa that is being imbued into the earth by the remains of the, the holiest person in Buddhism. Stupa usually also have some sort of walkway um, that facilitates the movement of people around the stupa. And stupas are circumnambulated in a clockwise direction towards the rising sun by worshippers. So they go around like this. 
So the hemispherical shape of the stupa is not only something that is containing like the heap of remains, um, but also is intended to create a microcosm or a mini universe. So when we look at this cosmic map of Buddhism, we have um, this circular form where you have the outer kind of like tiers on the outside. And then as you move upward, you're achieving enlightenment. So the central mass of umbrellas at the top um, of some of these monuments symbolizes the three jewels of Buddhism, the Buddha, the law, and the community. Um, and this is also the axis mundi, the, um, the center of the world, if you will, which is punctuated in the um, Buddhist cosmology by Mount Meru. This is also the center of the wheel of the Buddha, the unmoving um, center that represents enlightenment and nirvana, or nirvana. There are also four Tiranas or gates that flank the exterior of some stupa. Um, these gates face each of the four cardinal directions, and each of these directions represents one of the earthly realms in Buddhist cosmology. There's also connections to four important events in Buddha's life, his birth, his enlightenment, the first sermon, um, and his achievement of nirvana. So I would apply all this information to this next work, which is the Great Stupa. So this is a relatively early stupa, as you can tell by the date right here. Um, stupa were built en masse by King Ashoka, who was the first king to convert to Buddhism and begin the trend of constructing Buddhist stupa. It was said that he, um, that Buddha actually went to him and said, like, when I die, like, separate my ashes into, like, 88,000 piles and then bury each of those piles into a stupa. And then King Ashoka was like, okay. And so that's what he did. Some scholars speculate that this was an exaggeration. So um, there is a trapezoidal stairway that is on the south side that leads to this upper walkway right here. And this is a bird's eye view right here or plan. This is the walkway going around the central form of the stupa. And this is where worshipers will circumambulate or walk around the monument. So there are four Toranas on this particular stupa, and they look more or less like this right here. Um, so they have these very crowded, lively scenes in both high and low relief. Um, they are um, one of the more decorative elements of this particular complex. Um, a lot of scenes in these Toranas have um, scenes from Buddha's life, as well as some of the sites he visited, um, and then in this particular image right here that I wanted to, to include, there is an image of the sacred body tree, which is where Buddha like supposedly achieved enlightenment. Um, there's also an empty throne right here, or the empty seat, which is again signifying that Buddha is everywhere. He's omnipresent. Interestingly, as well, in this particular stupa, we have the depiction of yakshis, which are basically fertility spirits. And these are kind of like more local tradition. And I bring them up because these local these elements of local tradition are blended with a kind of like more universal and um, like broader um, traditions of Buddhism. So there is actually inscriptions on the stupa that indicate the names of over 600 people that contributed to its um, construction. Um, this was men, women, monks, common people, basically anybody who wanted a piece of that sweet stupa, like karmic capital pie. So again, if you contribute money to the construction of a stupa, that's one of the ways that you can um, like move your way up the ladder and achieve enlightenment eventually. So the stone was originally painted white. You can imagine that after 2,000 plus years, some of the pigment has worn away, revealing the natural color of the stone underneath. Our final work in this lecture set is Borobudur. So this is the world's largest Buddhist temple and a pilgrimage site. It was actually relatively hidden for several hundred years and came back into kind of like public knowledge around 200 years ago. So it's a pyramid-shaped monument with nine tiers, um, each of which is meant to be circumnambulated or walked around by a worshiper. 
So the lower six layers are squares. They represent the world of temptation. Um, the top three are circular. There's a couple of layers on the top that are circular. These represent the world of forms. And then the very top is the world of formlessness, which is essentially like nothingness. It's indescribable. This is representing usually nirvana. It's free of desire and attachment. So what's super interesting about this monument is that the movement of the pilgrim, the person who is coming to the site, who is a Buddhist who is like paying their respects to Buddhism and facilitating the practice of the religion is essentially following a three dimensional map of the Buddhist cosmological map. So we start at the very bottom in the world of um, temptations and desires. A lot of the relief sculptures in this particular area represent those temptations and desires. And then we see a similar trend with the middle, which is the world of forms. And then in the world of formlessness at the very top, there are, I believe, 72 stupas that are arranged in concentric circles. And then each of these stupas contains a statue of the Buddha inside. Interestingly, Borobudur in its um, kind of like massiveness represents that same that similar microcosm that like miniaturization of the universe that the just plain old great stupa does where you have this axis moody, the center of the world and then the tears kind of like going around it. So this particular monument contains more than 500 life-size Buddha statues, 1,500 stupas of varying size, and more than a mile and a half of narrative relief sculptures along these corridors as one makes their way to the top. So this is an incredible amount of work um, that is involved in creating something like this. That in volcanic stone is not particularly easy to shape, so this is really impressive. So the Buddhas surrounding um, or enclosed within the stupas are cross-legged um, and each of them has preaching mudra. So each of them is slightly different. So the Buddhas inside of the stupas also allude to the sepulchral function of the stupa itself, which is to be a reliquary for the body of the Buddha. So many of the stupas are relatively smaller and bell-shaped like these ones here. So it's like one giant stupa, and then there's more stupas on top of the stupa. The signs of this particular monument also align with the four cardinal directions, which is, again, one of those things that we see represented in the cosmological map. This is a um, ground plan of Borobudur to, again, give you a sense of these tiered layers, especially when we get to the top, to the worlds of forms and formlessness. We see a pretty like interesting similarity to this particular structure right here, this, this cosmological map. So this is very intentional. One of the relief sculptures that the AP curriculum wants to know is, here's a mouthful. <laughs> Queen Maya riding a horse carriage retreating to Lumbini to give birth to Prince Siddhartha Gautama. So <laughs> it's a mouthful, I know. So if you can approximate that phrase if you're asked about this on the test then that's totally fine so this is a narrative scene that is one of the aspects of buddha's like early life or even prior to his emergence as a person in the physical world um, the introduction of queen maya to the city of lumbini which is ends up being um siddhartha gautama's birthplace remember that siddhartha gautama is the buddha historically so the queen is sitting here reclining on her carriage. She's at rest while her attendants are kind of hustling and bustling around her. Um, and there's this royal procession. We have a series of umbrellas. She's got all of her people here. So this is one of many didactic relief sculptures at the site. Um, there are a lot of reliefs that allude to events in Buddha's life, particularly um, pertaining to his enlightenment. This video that is on this slide um, shows a couple of those reliefs in details, in, in detail, and then also gives you a couple of really stunning aerial views of Borobudur to give you a sense of just how large and expansive it is. Oh heck! Here we go. 
Buddhist cosmology, the Borobudur Temple Compound. The island of Java, Indonesia, Mount Merapi, meaning red fire, is an active volcano. The temple complex was rediscovered by the British in 1814. It is known as Borobudur among the local people. The base is a 1,200 square meter terrace topped with six tiers. The walls are adorned with numerous Buddha reliefs. The total length of the galleries when placed end to end stretches for five kilometers. Borobudur was probably built between the 8th and 9th centuries. The exact purpose of its construction is not clear. One theory is that the complex represents Buddhist cosmology. It's a mandala. A group of reliefs hidden at the back of lined stones at the base were discovered in 1885. It was a significant discovery. The words ugly face are inscribed in ancient Javanese script. It describes the earthly world dominated by greed. The monument represents the three worlds of Buddhist cosmology. The base level is the world of desire. The world of forms is above. Then comes the world of formlessness, the highest level of enlightenment. As visitors walk across the gallery, they enter the world of forms. They can see images of people trying to achieve mastery over worldly desires. The daughters of the author of evil opposed to Buddha are trying to seduce him. He absorbs himself in meditation, convinced they are illusions of his own mind. As visitors progress and reach the top level, the gate to the world of formlessness awaits. Stupas appear amid the world of formlessness, 72 are neatly lined. Statues of Buddha are hidden inside, they can be glimpsed through the grate. There is a 10 meter high stupa at the top of the monument. Standing right at the center of Borobudur, it encourages Buddhists the world over to strive for enlightenment with diligence.